about it. Yeah, it's going to look cool. Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford. On my channel about Norse myth, language, sagas, runes, etc., I talk about all kinds of topics that have something to do with one of those broad categories or sometimes nothing to do with one of those broad categories. I don't generally like being drawn into criticism of modern media, but I have done a little bit of that, either because I was talking about something that kind of legitimately charmed me a little bit, like uh, the 13th Warrior, or something that was a uh, subject of a lot of recent talk, like the Northman movie. What I thought I would do over the course of probably several spaced out videos, spaced out probably both in the sense that they won't come immediately one after another, but also in the sense that uh, I will probably seem spacey, as of course I am as I watch Three Hummingbirds Fight. Um, I thought that I would talk about a series of novels called the Hammer and the Cross Trilogy by Harry Harrison and quote John Holm. And my understanding is that John Holm is actually a pen name for Tom Shippey, a scholar in this field. Uh, actually, someone that I don't know at all. I've never met her or spoken to Tom Shippey. Presumably, he doesn't know who I am, so this is uh, neutral. Uh, I believe Harry Harrison passed away um, during my adulthood. I can't remember exactly when, um, but he was a science fiction writer who also wrote uh, another trilogy. It's actually very similar to The Hammer and the Cross, both in broad themes and, and um, some specific events called uh, the West of Eden trilogy, which is pretty weird, uh, but fun uh, set of sci-fi or alternate history books where uh, uh, dinosaurs had gone extinct in the new world, but not in the old world, and humans evolved in the new world, and then eventually came into contact with intelligent dinosaurs who had evolved in the old world. It's kind of fun. But in The Hammer and the Cross, we have yet another popular culture remix our interpretation of the Ragnar Lothbrok story, which I understand is also the basis for the Vikings TV show, which I've never seen. Um, it does a pretty good job, probably partially uh, that can be credited to Tom Shippey. Um, for example, the Old English, Old Norse, and Latin in these books, and uh, probably even more of the languages that come up in the later novels. I haven't read these books in 15 years, probably. Um, is actually good. And I encountered The Hammer and the Cross um, by pure accident, browsing around in a little used bookstore that was close to my high school. And I had started uh, in, in late high school to get interested in medieval history and languages. And so it was a fun first exposure to like a a popular reworking of, of what would eventually become my professional field, uh, and one that probably shaped me more than I realized in some ways, or shaped my attitude toward these things in, in, in some ways. I like the Hammer and the Cross trilogy. Um, I have fond memories of reading it back then. I, I probably read it a few times the first decade of the 21st century. Um, it's not, uh, it doesn't glorify the Viking Age, and it also doesn't trash it, and that's course what I prefer is to walk that line between glorifying and trashing because why ought I to have to do one or the other right um, as uh, Indiana Jones insists it's about facts not truth and that's what I'm interested in too although I think the novels contain some interesting truth some good you know just human messages in them too so let's look at the first few chapters of the original novel The Hammer and the Cross <laughs> Now, I have sort of come to claim the word dranger in, uh, in, in modern parlance. This is, of course, the greatest compliment in Old Norse uh, that, that one man could give to another. 
uh, a term of appreciation for a person who has reckless courage, usually a man, occasionally a woman. The word is actually pretty prominently used in the Hammer of the Cross trilogy, and I wonder how much that influenced my own uh, fondness for it and, and tendency to, to use it. Um, probably it's more indirect than that in that it, it influenced me to see it as much as I see it in Old Norse literature, right? It primed me for this word that I already had fun associations with from reading this, uh, this trilogy before I had read probably much of anything in Old Norse itself other than uh, Havamal, which I, I began tackling pretty early on. Um, it also uses a lot of other Old Norse vocabulary pretty frequently. Frandy, uh, meaning like kinsman, it's an affectionate term, uh, is used pretty often in these books, and that's also fairly reflective of Old Norse saga language, again showing the, um, the influence of, of Tom Shippey. And another thing that I like about it is that it uses TH to transliterate the letter ETH rather than D. I like that because, of course, the letter ETH stands for a TH sound, so transliterating right, Sigurd instead of Sigurd is actually closer to the Old Norse pronunciation sewer there. And when it came time for me to translate the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, as I did, it appears in my uh, in, in the Saga of the Volsungs book, uh, I was influenced by the way that, uh, the sort of simpler way that this trilogy translates the name of uh, Sigurdur Ormur i Auge, uh, Serpent in the Eye, as a snake eye, right? It sounds more like a nickname in, in English idiom and use that myself. The first novel, The Hammer and the Cross, is broken into three sections, Thrall, Karl, and Jarl, which are the three classes of human beings fathered by the god Heimdallr, or Rigur, and the poem Rigsua, which is included in most translations of the Poetic Edda. So, if you want to read along, this book, I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to keep some kind of comments on it as, as I go through it. Just things that I wrote down on index cards, right? Um, you can do this kind of like the 372 Pages podcast, if you've ever listened to that with uh, my friend Connor Lestoka and Mike Nelson of, of uh, Rift Tracks, formerly of MST3K, where they uh, read books they don't expect to like and, and, and riff on it, kind of like they do in Rift Tracks or, or MST3K. I'm not really going to be riffing on this. I, I don't dislike it. <laughs> um, but in a similar way, I'm not going to be telling you the, the whole story of it, but rather commenting on it in general terms that maybe you can appreciate it if you don't read it yourself, but that you might uh, get a lot more out of if you read it yourself. Um, I like the evocative landscape descriptions. One of the um, things I think is kind of fun about it is that it's not set in the most dramatic landscapes that you can imagine, like the ones that I live in and love, or like Scandinavia. It's actually mostly set right in England, and then in fact partially in uh, Denmark, which are not classically dramatic landscapes, but are still described really beautifully and evocatively, right? I, I think you can really appreciate um, the moody turns and the weather and on, on the English landscape. It's, it's, it gives me a... a uh, an appreciation for those flatlands. There's also really um, evocative senses that we get in the novel of people from different class backgrounds, right? The Middle Ages, both Viking society and, and the Christian English society, very classist, very explicitly classist, but because you would be conditioned either to a slave's kind of work or to a more middle-class farmer's life, or to a noble's life, that would show in your bearing, it would show in your physique, and the way that people are described uh, really speaks to that. We read about, quote, the upright stance of a man who had never had to plow or hoe for a living. Of course, that's true, right? There was probably a time when an upright stance conveyed that kind of privileged life, and not just someone who thought about their posture more, uh, as I unfortunately so often happen in my life. Um, as I mentioned, the story is a, a one more spinoff in popular culture of the Ragnar Lothbrok story. We have an early scene where Ragnar Lothbrok wrecks off the coast of England. This is a little bit different from how it goes in his saga, where he actually manages to 
raid in England a good bit before he's captured. But in the book, he is captured uh, straight out of the sea after his ship's wreck off of the coast of England during a storm. He is identified as Ragnar Lothbrok by the, quote, shaggy clothes of tarred goatskin, which is, of course, the explanation for Ragnar's nickname, Lothbrok, shaggy pants in the saga. So that's a nice little little touch that I don't think is usually there in, in modern interpretations of, of uh, Ragnar. Uh, so that happens in chapter one. Ragnar crashes off the coast of England and is captured. In chapter two, there is a lengthy discussion by the English noblemen and priests about this Viking leader they've captured. Um, as, who, as Ragnar. Um, actually, it, it occurs to me that in the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, they don't immediately know that it's Ragnar. It's not till he's dead, as I recall, that they realize it. Uh, but here they realize it pretty early on, and um, they discuss his great reputation as a torturer, which is made up as far as the medieval sources go. He's not uh, a noted uh, torturer. That's not really something that, that's ever attributed to heroes in the Icelandic sagas. Uh, in the saga 2, the uh, snake pit that Ragnar Lothbrok is thrown into is not the work of the church. It is actually the work of the church in uh, The Hammer and the Cross. I think it's a little over the top. Um, you know, the church abhors bloodshed. And while that is not always perfectly <laughs> adhered to in spirit, um, in general, by the letter of the law, the church would typically not uh, wish to execute someone in such a way. And uh, it seems, you know, over the top as, as the work of the church rather than the king. Um, I like the way that the authors kind of evoke Old English without using it. Uh, sometimes by using a, an archaic English word that comes from a somewhat obscure old English word and then use the the regular modern English word that's perhaps from Latin or French together with it. I'm talking about, quote, the rake and the vengeance. Technically, both of those words mean vengeance, but rather than being redundant, what that does for me is kind of evoke that older language while not condescending to me by not explaining it or, um, you know, acting like the audience is... Uh, possessed of bizarre vocabulary knowledge that probably most people aren't. So, and it, and it reminds me of Robinson Jeffers too, which is always a plus. He often uses uh, synonyms like that in that way. There is a lavish description of preparing the uh, the, the, the orm garther or worm yard, the serpent pit that Ragnar is thrown into, which is kind of fun. And we see, uh, as Ragnar is dragged to it, the uh, evocation of the Norse saying that, uh, quote, a man should not limp while both his legs are the same length. That's actually from Cormac Saga. So that's a fun little shout out to that saga. Um, we see early on a uh, pretty realistic depiction of how an old English speaker and an old Norse speaker would understand one another not perhaps having immediate comprehension of every little detail of vocabulary, but being able to make the right substitutions to understand what's being said with a little bit of thought. So Erkenbert, one of the clerics, says worm yard, and Ragnar kind of glosses that. He says Ormgard, which is the Old Norse term, right? Snake pit, as it occurs in his saga. By the way, um, his death in the snake pit, I believe, is only part of the Norse story. I don't think I've ever seen that referenced in the English story. But, of course, this is based more on Norse stories than English ones. Um, we have, as Ragnar dies in the snake pit, kind of a version of Krokomal, the most famous poem uh, containing a version of his dying words or dying poem. Actually, there's several versions, but Krokomal is the most famous. Although it kind of overstresses the rape and slaving part of his career, there is a realistic repetition of the part of Krokomal where he says, always I struck with the sword. There's a really rad depiction of him 
fighting back against the snakes, right? He bites them, he tramples them uh, like a whale, right? Because he's got his, his arms tied behind his back, but he, you know, thumps over them, <laughs> uh, which is, is kind of fun. And he dies with the words, Gnidia undu grisir ed galtar hag visi, which of course is from, uh, I believe, the saga and Krokomol. And I think the short story of Ragnar's sons, uh, and all of them, those are supposedly among his last words, and they mean the piglets would squeal if they knew the old boar's condition. Of course, referring to his sons who will avenge him. Let me give you a quick word from my friends at Grimfrost, and I'll come back and talk a little bit more about these first three chapters. So Ragnar dies in the snake pit, and a character made up for this novel trilogy named Viga Brander, Killer Brand, usually just called Brand, who is a Norwegian Viking from Hologaland. He is in fact called Champion of the Men of Hologaland, which in Old Norse would be Holoikikapi. That would be a great name for a saga hero. Um, he goes to Denmark to tell the sons of Ragnar about Ragnar's death. Now, in the saga, this is not a specific named person, but I believe rather um, one of the men from the English court. Now, one of the fun little details here is as he approaches the Bratheraborg, this is actually a transliteration of the modern Icelandic name in Old Norse, you'd expect Bratheraborg, uh, the fortress of the brothers. He hides his Thor's hammer pendant, which is a fun little detail. In this series of novels, the pendants are actually worn by members of a particular school of paganism, which is a little bit, I guess you could say, like reform paganism relative to the, the harsher paganism of people like the Ragnarsons. Uh, this is a big plot point later on, but we don't quite know that at this point in the story yet. Um, fun little, other really, really fun little details. As he approaches the Brother Borg, he also puts away the dragon head off of, from off of his ship. And of course, in the uh, Lanovok, the Book of the Settlers of Iceland, we read, uh, I think, the first part of the quote, Old Heathen Laws, is that you have to put away the dragon head from your ship as you approach land, because otherwise the spirits of the land will interpret you as threatening. He introduces himself as Brond. The shore watchman says, many men are called Brand, and he says, some call me Viga Brand. That kind of understated way of introducing one's badass, very dranger nickname, strikes me as very realistically saga in a way that I think so few movies and TV shows get that, that like understated menace right. At the Bridgerborg, Brand observes the pretense that all true dranger are supposed to be equal but, of course, we see the esteemed position that the Ragnar sons have relative to the others. So that, you know, even though there's this pretense at equality, the society is still not much less classist than the English one. Brand announces the death of Ragnar, and we see the famous scene that is in the short story of Ragnar sons, where they each react in dramatic ways. One of them is trimming his nails with a knife, he cuts a finger as he listens. Uh, one is playing uh, what's called checkers in the book. It's probably supposed to be Hnevatavl, the uh, Viking board game. And he cuts his hand on a piece that he squeezes really tight. Um, another one is holding onto his spear shaft. And as he lets go of it, it turns out that he's you know, squeezed the spear shaft into, into pieces because he's, he's listening so intently as, as Bronn tells them how Ragnar dies. We have a nice shout out to Njal Saga as one of them asks, how did our old father die? It is not to be surprised at, since he was getting on in years. This is something that uh, um, I think Skarpheden says in Njal Saga during the burning, so that's a cool shout out. Um, and of course, now I see all these shout outs 20 years later, right? Um, it's fun just to see how much of that is worked in there, that it works very smoothly in the book, 
and it also works as a great Easter egg, I suppose is the term, if you if you know these these references. Well, he tells them what Ragnar said in Norrent Mall, that means Old Norse language, in uh, Old Norse, it's transliterated here. Interestingly, actually translated from the Old Norse instead of the modern Icelandic, so that makes it incompatible with the Brother Borg, but that's a quibble. And Brand addresses the brothers as Haldan, Ubi, Ivar, famous for your white hair, and Sigurd, snake eye. So this combines the sons from the Icelandic tradition with the sons from Saxo Grammaticus's Latin telling, uh, Ubi being one of the sons that only Saxo talks about, as I recall. He's certainly not in the Old Norse versions, but um, other versions of the Ragnar story bring Ubi in together with uh, Ivar and Sigurd Snake Eye from the uh, Icelandic tradition too. And they stand on a block to swear an oath and they drink the funeral ale, the Arval. So of course that is in fact the funeral ale is what it's called when you, uh, uh, that's, that's the toast that you drink at a funeral. Chapter three, the Thanes in England, here the Ragnarsons are coming with their raven banner woven by Ragnar's daughters all in one night that flutters in victory and droops in defeat. That is true detail of the Ragnar legend, of course, which is pretty cool. We see the uh, that the number 10 dozen is discussed as a quote, a long hundred that is realistic to both Old Norse and Old English. It's pretty cool. See that kind of detail again. In the Viking camp, we learned that Ivar, quote, is called the boneless one, but never in his presence. That, of course, is a menacing hint for later. And we see the terrifying silent raid of a Viking called Sigvarth. Actually, there's another version of Sigurd, but he's a saint character from Sigurd Snake Eye. Uh, meant simply to kill and not to rob with uh, no warning. This is... Uh, meant to be extremely menacing, and it comes across as very menacing in, in the story. Our main character for the novel is, at this point in his life, a uh, possible slave, possible not slave. There's some disputes about his, his uh, exact parentage and the meaning of it. Uh, his name is Chef. Now, that is called a dog's name, and maybe it would be. It would mean something like Sheaf of Corn. But, notably, if you've read Beowulf, you know that shield sheving, containing that same word shev, becomes the founder of a great dynasty, so we might wonder what chef's life has in store for him, right? And we have chef as part of an East Anglian army facing off against the Viking Sigvar's contingent, with both sides dismounting first. Realistic detail of medieval combat. Um, uh, both the Vikings and the English did not use uh, cavalry. And we have the Vikings fighting in wedge formation, quote, a formation said to be invented by their war god, off quote, that is something from Saxon too. And then we have a uh, first fight between them, which discusses a lot of the real shock and real fatigue of combat, which I think is uh, very well detailed and, and, and admirably done, considering how often it seems like in movies and TV shows and books and games and such, people just fight and fight and fight without getting tired or getting you know, truly lastingly hurt, as they often do in real combat. Well, that's the first three chapters of The Hammer and the Cross. Like I said, this will probably be spaced out. I'm not doing uh, a whole, taking a whole lot of notes, reading this a whole lot. This is just something for uh, uh, now and then. And hopefully the audio on this has been okay. This is part of a series of videos that I'm making during a long writing uh, period. I'm, I'm just breaking ground really hard on my fifth book, but I am also in a remote location with my microphone broken and the wind blowing so hard that it's hard to film too far from the house. So I hope that's somewhat entertaining maybe it gets you to check out this uh fun series that i think is still available on kindle if, if possibly out of print in physical medium and for now thank you very much to my patreon supporters 
who have allowed me to continue making a living from teaching. And to everyone out there from beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best.